In today's show, the Golden State Warriors are bad, and that is good news for the Portland Trail Blazers, plus a Shaden Sharp injury update. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trail Blazers, your daily Portland Trail Blazers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making this show your first listen. Coming at you Monday through Friday, so make it a part of your daily routine. Make it your first listen as Locked On Blazers, your team every day. In today's show, we got a Shaden Sharp injury update. Our first edition of the Haters Corner, Golden State Warriors, come on down. They stink, and it's good news for your Portland Trailblazers, plus a couple mailbag questions from listeners of the program about Anthony Simon's trade value in a Freaky Friday situation with Tumati Kamara and Duop Reef. Let's, let's get the news out of the way first, and then we will invite the haters on down. Shout out to my man, Silky Johnson. Shaden Sharp. At an MRI today that revealed he has a lower abdominal strain. He'll be reevaluated again in two weeks. Uh, he's been missing time with what they were calling an abductor strain. That's your groin. I feel like your groin is the lowest part of your, your abdominal muscles. I feel like it's the bottom. I'm not a doctor. I'm a doofus. But um, the language has changed slightly. I don't know that that indicates that anything has changed necessarily. If you are a doctor and you're listening you know, email me, lockdownblazerspot at gmail.com. But uh, he's been dealing with this groin injury, and now he's going to be out for for at least two weeks. The language in, in the press release is reevaluated in two weeks. When the Blazers put out a press release about your injury, it's bad. You're going to miss time. Um, otherwise, they just, like, leave people in the dark, and DeAndre Ayton misses three weeks with no information. But if they put out a, if they put out a PDF uh, in an email, they attach a PDF to an email, it's bad news. So if, if Sharp is going to miss two weeks, that would be... Um, the 29th of January is when he would be reevaluated. The Blazers would play play uh, the Milwaukee Bucks with a with a certain point guard back here in uh, Portland on uh, January 31st. So if he were to come back right away, he would miss six games. If he were to be if it were to be longer than that, um, the Blazers have uh, they they you know he could he could miss he could miss six plus. He's already missed two, so there would be eight with this current injury. Uh, Sharp sustained this on December 19th. Played the first eight minutes of a game against the Phoenix Suns, left and did not return. The team announced that he had this groin strain. Then he missed the next five games and he returned after that, but he was on a minutes limit, right? It's like, okay, he's not going to play a whole, a whole, whole, whole bunch, but he's on a minutes limit. He comes back, he plays, you know, 22, 20, 23 minutes for the first three games of those, uh, of his return. And then against the Nets, he's like, he plays 40 minutes, he plays into overtime, he plays down crunch time in the fourth quarter and into OT. He looked good, like had a really good game and they needed him and there's like a, a, a win they desperately needed and uh, a a bunch of bad losses and 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 Shea earned the minutes and they kept him on the court because he needed him. Scoot was the guy who watched at the end of games and uh, rightfully so at the end of that game and rightfully so. But he played 40 minutes in that game and then they got thrashed the next two games. So he didn't play a bunch against the Knicks and OKC. But in that OKC debacle when they're down 62 after three quarters, he left in the third quarter and the Blazers announced that again he had this right he had this abductor strain, the thing that he'd been dealing with, and he missed you know the rest of the OKC game. He wasn't going to play anymore after that anyway. But uh, because they were down 62 after three quarters, but um, he didn't he didn't play the next night in Minnesota. He didn't play uh, Sunday against the Suns. And so that's the first two. And if he were to miss two more weeks, it's at least six more games. So it'd be eight. Uh, and it could be more than that. that. That's what you need to know about Shane Sharp. I mean, it's it's. You've seen it a lot recently. Like he's missed. What is that? He's missed seven of the last 13 games. So he's he's the the rotation not going to change too much. You're going to see. Um, See a bunch of Ant, see a bunch of Scoot, see a little, a little bit of Malcolm Brogdon. He may or may not be traded in the next two weeks, so then you'll see the new a, a new player if they have it. Uh, Portland can and will need to in the coming days uh, make a decision and sign either do up to a full contract or cycle through 10-day guys, which I think is much more likely. So wouldn't be shocker if they sign someone to a 10-day contract who can play a little bit of guard with Shaden Sharp out. But it's just a bummer. It's a bummer. Like, you just want... You want Shane Sharp to play. He's the most fun when he was rolling. It was the most fun part of the season. Um, he just has not got. He has not been able to get back to that level. Whether that's health or a combination of things, it's probably a combination of things. It usually is. Um, and so, like, 
I hope he gets healthy. I hope he stays out. I hope he misses as much time as he needs to get healthy and play his best basketball over, you know, February, March, and the first couple days of April, and then um, can get rolling into year three. It's just been, it's been a bummer second half um, or middle third of the season for Sharp just not being able to get out on the court. And yeah, he's like one of the reasons you tune into this team. There, there aren't a lot, and he is near the top of the list. So um, yeah, get well soon, Shay. I, I hope it works out for you. Okay. Come on down to Haters Corner. This is the first edition of Haters Corner. Probably going to do a lot of Haters Corner here down the stretch of run of the season because you know what we need? We need a little bit of joy. Sometimes to find that little bit of joy, you need to be mean to those, uh, I guess, punching up, but sort of punching down. Here's the good news about the Golden State Warriors being bad. It's just it's just always a win for the Portland Trail Blazers every time they lose. The Blazers, by virtue of the deal for um, that they made with the Boston Celtics, they have the 2024 Warriors first round draft pick. That's this coming June in the draft, and it's it's top four protected. So if it's picks one through four, the Warriors keep it, and it goes to next year, and it's top one protected in 2025. But if it is any of the other selections in the first round, five and below, the Blazers get it, and they'll end up with two first round picks. And y'all, it's looking good. It's looking good because the the Warriors are just straight up bad. They're just not a good team. They're they're twelfth in the West. They're eighteen and twenty two. They're eleven and eleven at Chase Center. And tonight, this evening, I'm recording this on Monday evening. You're listening to Tuesday, January sixteenth show. I appreciate your patronage. They get Draymond Green back, back from suspension. Draymond's back. Their emotional center, the guy who's going to be um, their emotional core, I should say, the, the guy who's going to guide them and make them a respectable defense again and unlock more of what Steph does. So you have less Trace Jackson Davis. You have less Jonathan, or excuse me, you have less, you might have more Jonathan Kaminga. You have less Kevon Looney. You can play small ball, which is, you know, what the thing that your dynasty was built on and all of these things. And what do they do? They go into Memphis on MLK Day and they get lit up by G.G. Jackson. You don't know who that is. <laughs> I do because he was supposed to go to Carolina, but Gigi Jackson has a career-high 23 off the bench. Vince Williams Jr. has 24. The Memphis Grizzlies, without John Moran, without Desmond Bain, beat the Warriors to send them to 18-22. and 22. The Warriors are, are 12th in the West. Uh, as I'm recording, this is halftime of Lakers uh, Thunder. It's um, So I don't know what's going to happen with the Lakers tonight, but they're either going to be a half game or a game and a half ahead of the Warriors, depending on what happens at the end of the Thunder game. I'm going to call it now. <laughs> the, 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 the Lakers lost too. It's haters' corner. Everybody's losing. Um, the Warriors are 12th in offense. They're 23rd in defense. They're a bad basketball team that can't stop anyone from scoring, and their offense uh, you know, is not elite as it as it once was to to prop them back up the the secret to the warrior sauce is always that they were a good defense the last year of the mark jackson era they were top five in defense or fifth in defense steve kerr takes over and they are freaking dynasty and then the dynasty is fading and you're watching it fade and the blazers are going to get another lottery pick because of fading dynasty uh just for fun here's what happened the warriors had to salary dump andre iguodala so they sent him to the Memphis Grizzlies and they said okay we got to get we got to get off this money and the Grizzlies said we're going to need a draft pick for your troubles they trade a draft pick to the Memphis Grizzlies then the Grizzlies they wanted they they were letting Dylan Brooks walk and they wanted some help and so they said hey we're going to we're going to trade for Marcus Smart and we're going to get any of that defensive boost we need and and they made a deal for Marcus Smart and the and the Celtics had to do that because they wanted to upgrade and get Chris Tapps Porzingis. So now the Celtics have this this draft pick from um, from the uh, from the Grizzlies via the Warriors. But then the Blazers trade uh, trade Damian Lord to the Milwaukee Bucks, and all of a sudden the Milwaukee Bucks have this elite point guard, and Drew Holiday is available for trade. And what do the what do the Celtics do? They capitalize and they trade this pick, a salary dumped Andre Iguodala. They trade this pick back to the Blazers. The Warriors stink. They're not good. Chris Paul's out for an extended period of time with a broken hand. They just can't quite figure it out with their young players. Uh, Clay Thompson is not what he once was. It's sad to see, but he's not what he once was. They cannot get... Uh, Wiggins played fine tonight, but they can't get him going in any meaningful way. When they were really good and they won the title in 2022, he was really good, and they can't get him going. Right now, if the season were to end today, 
the Golden State Warriors pick would be 10th. 10th. Obviously, lottery odds and all those things. But 10th. 10th. The Blazers would end up, if it ended today, with the 5th pick and the 10th pick in the draft. That's a good deal. Welcome to Hater's Corner. Um, you know, obvious caveat. The Warriors are probably going to chase it. And over the next three weeks, they're probably going to make a trade and try to get better and try to salvage the end of the Steph Curry era. Probably. And they'll probably, I assume they'll be a little better than below 500. But they're 12th in the West, and there's just teams better than them. I think there's nine very comfortably better than them teams. And then there's the Lakers, Houston, and Utah. Utah is rolling. Houston reportedly wants to trade and try to get better and chase the playoffs. And the Lakers are have LeBron James and Anthony Davis. I don't know what about the rest of them, but they have those two gentlemen. Even if even if the Warriors are better, they're going to be a play-in team. Right now, they're outside the play-in. They're 12th. They're two games. They're two teams outside the two spots outside the play-in. But even if they get rolling, they're a play-in team. They are, they are, they are playing elimination, single elimination games to make the playoffs and avoid the lottery altogether. So welcome to the haters' corner. It's good news. We'll keep checking in on you down to our good friends down in San Francisco where they are 11-11 and 11 at Chase Center. They're just a mediocre basketball team, and the Blazers are benefiting. It's good news. Welcome to the haters' corner. Okay. Uh, let's do some mailbag questions, including a first one from a couple different listeners about Amphrey Simon's trade value. That's what we'll do in the second segment. But first, I want to tell you that this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Listen, Be- BetterHelp is the online therapy tool set up to be convenient and easy and flexible for you. You know, if you're considering therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? Therapy can be really useful if you have an acute traumatic event. If you're dealing with a specific trauma in your life that you want to work through and you want to talk to a therapist and you want to say, hey, this is this is, this is is the thing that I need help with. But it can also just be routine maintenance for your brain and for your body and for your mind. You can... You can become the better version of yourself, or moreover, you can become equipped with the tools to live the best version of your life. Therapy can give you those tools to try to get better or try to make things easier. So if you're already doing the work, why not look into BetterHelp and see if someone can help you make that work easier? Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. Get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on N. B A. All right. This was going to be a full mailbag episode, but we got. Uh, then I watched the Warriors lose on MLK Day in Memphis. My man GG Jackson <laughs> went nuts, and I had to bring him on down to the haters' corner and also Shaden Sharp news. So this this is a mini mailbag. Um, if you have a mailbag question in the future, or answer listener submitted questions right here on the show. The way to do it is to send me an email locked on blazerspod at gmail.com. Uh, a lot of questions I may respond to via email and then I'll use later in the show, like these. A couple questions from Dr. J and listener Michael. Um both asked versions of this regarding Amphrey Simon's trade value. Dr. J's concern was like, concern, his query rather, was that, you know, say you're trading Malcolm Brogdon for um, for a protected pick and salary filler to make it work, but really you're trading Malcolm Brogdon for a protected pick. Is there a level where if you were to just trade Amphrey Simon's and step up and say multiple picks, a young player, all these things. Like, is there a package where you would just say, yeah, let's, let's hold on to let's, that's the guard we're going to keep Malcolm Brogdon and we'll pivot off Anthony Simons. Um, and listener, Michael offered the, the sort of caveat looking around the league was that while Terry Rozier is four or five years older than Anthony Simons and much more of an established player in the league. They have pretty similar production and pretty similar style this year. And that, and Terry Rozier is likely to net, a protected first round pick and salary filler. And Michael was worried that like, if that is the future value of Ant, isn't it going to be a problem when the Blazers have to make a decision? And do they, is there sort of this opportunity cost situation that they're going to run up into? Or is this just like an inevitable disappointment for Blazer fans that when you do, if, if they were to pivot off Amphrey Simons, it wouldn't net enough. And I think um, the like, the two queries kind of meet here, right? Um, I wouldn't pivot off Amphrey Simons because he's 24 years old. He's pretty freaking good on offense. And you just don't know what you have in the two young guards yet. 
in theory, Scoot Henderson will take over the reins and be the starting point guard of the future, and it'll be obvious that it is his team at some point. But he doesn't look like that right now. He looks like a 19-year-old a figuring it out in the league. He shows some flashes, but he looks, I mean, he's struggled, and the efficiency thing is like, he just he, he's just not an efficient offensive player. Not surprisingly, not in any way that you would be like, oh no, I can't believe the 19-year-old point guard isn't ready to play in the league. It's like as predictable as anything could have possibly been, uh, but it's true. Like he's not, you don't know what he's going to become. And Shaden Sharp, he's, he shows these flashes, but the consistency of, of high level play just hasn't been there for like a sustained period of time. When he's good, he's great. He's, he's really talented. Uh, but you know, the, the challenge of all players in the league is, is to do it consistently. Every Simons is just a good offensive player. Just really, he's just a really good offensive player. He has been bad the last couple of weeks for sure. And I think the partnership with him and, and Scoot Henderson has been Rocky. Um, and I think there is a point where if those two can't coexist together at any, and at, any, at any level that's positive, that's a bigger problem. But I don't think for me, I think it is pretty clear that it's, so that, that's why I wouldn't pivot off Avery Simons, right? Because you just, you just don't know. You don't know what you have behind him. Secondly, I think it's pretty clear that Avery Simons archetype doesn't have much trade value. The not quite point guard, not very, you know, somewhere between not very good and straight up bad defenders, uh, combo guards who are weak on defense, just it has not been, um, it is not an archetype that teams have sought out at high levels. You look at what Jordan Poole got traded for, you look at how the in Miami Heat still have Tyler Hero despite trying to trade him for multiple off seasons to teams with better players. Um, you know, you, you, at least reportedly, the Blazers kind of shopped Anthony Simons around ahead of Damian Lord's departure. How serious they did that, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that they really looked into it. But reportedly, they looked into it and then, and the deals weren't quite out there. In fact, offering uh, you know Anthony Simons to the Brooklyn Nets, although there's been some refuting whether they that, that trade really uh, got that level of discussion really got there. But like, you're, I, I don't think that style of player has particularly high trade value so pivoting off now and like committing to this when you're not going to get a particularly good haul doesn't it just doesn't make sense to me it doesn't make sense because Anthony Simons is good and it doesn't make sense because he has more value as a basketball player that plays currently than someone who is not particularly valuable on the than, than he would be as a return uh as, as a trade chip I think there is at some point like if you don't move off of Simons, you and and then you want to. Obviously, you might not want to. Maybe he turns out to be for, maybe at twenty six. Every Simons is so clearly like excellent that um, this conversation seems silly. And you you were like, hey, remember when that the lockdown Blazers doofus did like eight minutes about trading Ant, Ant way back when? But I think like moreover, the 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 real truth here is that like. There is at some point an opportunity cost of not trading him, but if 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 it's, I think Amphrey Simons is on a track that he's still going to be like protected first round pick, if not multiple protected first round picks and salary filler into the future than he as he would be now. I I don't think his value is going to crater. I don't think it's going to get worse. And if it's not very good now, and there's no real reason to do it, I don't think there is a like. There, there isn't a level that reaches the Dr. J threshold where it's like, this is package is so much better than what they could get from Malcolm Brogdon. Then you really have to think about what's the future is going to be. And there isn't, um, and as, as listener Michael points out, the, because that package is so kind of maybe underwhelming right now, what's the rush to chase a bad deal? There's no rush to chase a bad deal. You don't have to do it. It's just not, it's not pragmatic for a variety of reasons. So here's what you do. You move forward with Anthony Simons. You just move forward with him. And you, if it becomes so clearly obvious that Scoot has to play and that Shaden has to, you know, I think Shaden is clearly, you'd rather play him next to one of those two guards than those two guards together. But it's like um, that, that the young players, particularly Shaden and Scoot specifically, have to play because they're too good not to play. Not because you're like invested in them, but they're just too good, like literally just too good at basketball to keep them on the bench then you've revisited. But until then, you can be patient because if it's a meh deal now at the 2024 deadline and then you end up getting a meh deal now at the 2025 deadline, what's the what's the opportunity cost? What did you what did you lose? Um you know, there is a, there is some point where the graph changes, but I think for now you just move forward with it. I think that's that's 
that's the sort of the, where those two queries meet. Thank you, Dr. J and Michael for the question. I got another question, a Freaky Friday situation talking doo-wop brief and Tumani Kamara. That's what we'll do to close the show. Join me in that third segment, won't you? But first, let's talk Jay's Case, the company that wants to give you peace of mind. Uh, Jay's Case is... They know that life can be uncertain and they know that having certainty and having comfort and having things on hand that can solve some of your problems or at least address some of your problems can offer you that comfort, can offer you that peace of mind. That's why Jace Medical invented the Jace case. It is a pack of five different antibiotics that treat, treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, UTIs, respiratory infections, skin infections, among other things. These things happen. And if it would uh, if it would give you peace of mind and give you comfort to have antibiotics in your home so you could treat these things when they come up, visit jacemedical.com, talk to a physician. That conversation will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and then your medications will be delivered to your pharmacy, your local pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today, so go to jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com and use the offer code Locked On to get $20 off your order. Still a pass versus point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked On Blazers. Rolling through some mailbag questions. If you want to get a mailbag question in or you just want to send me an email, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com is the way to do that. Um, that's... That's the spot to contact me. So contact me there if you're looking for me. Uh, that is lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Like so many of you already do. Shout out to the mailers. Okay, this one comes from listener Alex, who sends a lot of would you rathers, but this is my favorite would you rather. Alex, I appreciate you with the with the would you rathers. Would you rather have do up would you rather have do up wreath have the defensive game of Tumani Kamara or Tumani Kamara have the offensive game of Duop Wreath? Okay, so with these Freaky Friday body swap things, it's always a question of like, what are the rules? <laughs> Is So if face value, I want Duop Wreath to have Tumani Kamara's defensive game because I just size, right? Like imagine if Duop Wreath at how big and physical and long arm he is and he's just he's bigger he's like thicker than and then tamani kamara they're probably about the same height but like he's just big like he's he's much more center sized and shaped um imagine if he was like guarding point guards 94 feet from the rim like and and um and and still able to like sort of set screens and do all of those things that he does on offense like if that's it if it's just like plug and play he immediately gets the the speed and quickness and balance and timing of tamani kamara on defense like yeah, I think this is a no-brainer. But if there is some logic to it, like um, Duop Reith gets the hands and anticipation and intensity of of Tamari Kamara, but he still has his own lateral quickness, then um, I think I lean the other way. Uh, I will say this. When this question was asked, Duop Reith was shooting above league average from three. He's now slightly below league average. He's like basically exactly a league average shooter from three. Um, he's shooting like 36 and some change, and the league average is like 36 and a half. He's right there. Um, we're talking percentage points, but he's slight, like he's a league average shooter. So it's basically like, and that's really what he brings on offense. Like he's got he's got decent touch around the rim. He's got better touch than Tamari around uh, than Tumani around the rim, um, and he's a physical screen setter. But he's not a great passer. Um, you know, I, I I like I like I like his game. I think he I think he, he gives pretty solid effort. Like I don't I don't think you get like crappy do up minutes. I think mostly when you get crappy do up minutes because he's like physically outmatched, uh, but. I think if you were just to make Tumani Kamara, like, the simplest thing here, it's like, if the Freaky Friday rules are, are just like straight swap, give me do up wreath with the Tumani Kamara skill set. But if it's more like you are a similar player to you are with like the added sprinkling skills of it, I think you lean Tumani because say you keep Tumani, all of what Tumani does. Um, side note real quick, I think we are seeing the... Um, I think the Blazers have reached the positive returns, the maximize their positive returns on, um, on Tumani Kamara pressing, and it's at some point diminishing returns because he. There's been times, particularly in that Minnesota game, where I felt like he was pressuring 90 feet from the rim, and they were just kind of like getting into their offense four on five, like against competent point guards, particularly like the sort of Michael Conley types, um, you know, guys who just aren't going to make mistakes and type of thing. It's like I, I think I think starting your defense that far from the basket actually is is has some 
drawbacks. I think diminishing returns. I think we've reached, I'm, I'm pro pressing in general, but I think it needs to be more of a change up than every single time down the floor. I know it's kind of like a intensity thing and it's what Tumani wants to do. And, and, and Chauncey likes the, like the, the tone it sets. But I, again, I, I think, I th kind of think we've gone, to, we've gone too far. Dial it back. Just, you know, do it half as much. Um, Apologies to, to Tom Abertro's stats because he will be sad that the Blazers don't do it as much. Uh, but Tumani as a 36%, like league average three-point shooter is a really good basketball player. And it's like you can, like, Freaky Friday stuff aside, Tumani might end up, Tumani, you can get better at shooting, particularly standstill shooting. You can go take, you know, you can make 500 jumpers a day in the summer and improve to, you know, a league average or something like it over the course. Like not everyone can, right? It's not magic, but shooting is a skill you can get better at, particularly if you have if you work with the right people and you work with the right, you know, the Blazers kind of put you in spots and you work on the way that you're going to, hey, you are going to shoot it from the wings and the corner. So make sure that you can dial from the wings and the corner. Um, it Like the big problem right now with the Blazers offense is that they're putting often multiple non-shooters on the court, Scoot Henderson and Tumani Kamara. And so when you're running a pick and roll with Avery Simons, he's got nowhere to go. He's got nowhere to go. Like, like, they're just like, cool, we'll be standing in the paint waiting for you. And Ant is, he's kind of gotten caught in between sometimes on drives because there's a million people in the paint. Or he's like, starts to go downhill, sees somebody, gets, you know, gets, um, you know, makes a decision. And then by the time he passes out, it's easy to rotate out because, it, you know, Tumani's not going to, um, he's passed up some shots because he shot bricks, or or they know that Scoot's going to drive the closeout, so they stop short and they and they and they catch it, and the spacing's bad because Ant's in the middle and Scoot's driving in the middle, and it's just a mess, right? Playing with two non-shooters and a pick and roll point guard is just not a, it doesn't work in the NBA. You got to have the reason that spread pick and rolls work is because they're spread. Um, if Tumani Kamara was shot thirty six percent from three, if he shot was he a league average or slightly below league, like right at league average three point shooter the Blazers offense would, a lot of their challenges would be solved because if he was a knockdown or at least like a, if teams weren't like him, like we want 33 to shoot, right? Like we, it, it, that's what it is now. We want him to shoot. We're going to help off him. We want him to shoot. And, and he knows it. And he's kind of, his confidence has waned a little bit on offense. If he just, if he just knocked him down a league average clip, Blazers offense, a lot of it gets unlocked. So depending on the Freaky Friday rules, I think I lean to money because it's a more reasonable skill change to have him be a true 3 and D wing than to have Duop Reith be like, um, I don't know, super thick Dennis Rodman or whatever he would become. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, Clarify the rules for me, Alex, and we'll follow up at some later date with another uh, with another Would You Rather. Okay, that's going to do it for today's show. Come back tomorrow. Uh, as it stands now, depending on the weather in the Dallas Metroplex area tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's show is going to be a draft look ahead with my man, Raphael Barlow from Lockdown NBA Big Board. Uh, going to be a whole bunch of fun. We're going to talk about the top of the draft. Please just have, you know, they're going to have two draft picks because the Warriors suck, baby. So we'll talk about that and uh, we will get you covered. So make sure don't, don't miss that one. Come back for that show. Uh, and then we'll do uh, more the rest of the week. The Blazers play uh, the Brooklyn Nets on Wednesday evening. So we'll recap that one on Thursday and I'm cooking up another one for Friday, another interview. So uh, what, once I get it locked down, I'll tease it right here on the program. That's what we do five days a week, wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.